Okay, it's not going to be just me talking today. I'll then hand over to Yanni, Marta, and Jenny to tell you a bit more about specific projects in our group. Um, I'll just give you a brief overview of what we're doing. So the <clears throat> at the heart of our research are vaccines for vulnerable populations and overcoming immune dysfunction. So basically by vulnerable populations, we're specifically interested in those with chronic diseases and the aging population. With chronic diseases, we're focusing mainly on metabolic disease like type 2 diabetes and obesity. And really what we're trying to do is understand immune responses in the, these populations, how it compares to healthy people and how we can understand mechanisms and use that to design better vaccines or design new vaccines specifically targeted at these populations who are at more risk, at higher risk of severe outcome from infection and also more susceptible to becoming infected in the first place. And we're studying all of this uh, in three different areas, which are highlighted on this slide. One of them is meliodosis, is a neglected tropical disease prevalent in Southeast Asia and Northern Australia, caused by the gram negative intracellular bacterium Burkholderia pseudomalli. Um, the other one, also a big part of what we're doing, is COVID 19 all of you know, caused by SARS-CoV-2. And we're part of two big consortia to investigate immune responses uh, in the context of COVID-19. One of them is a national consortium called PITCH, and the other one is international called CECO variants. And then finally, uh, one of the new additions uh, to our portfolio is uh, identifying new vaccine candidates for AMR uh, pathogens, including E. coli and Klebsiella pneumonia. Um, so I'll start off with the COVID-19 work we are doing uh, and just uh, briefly introducing the Pitch Consortium to you again. I've mentioned this last year, but just as a recap and for all of you who are new, um, an introduction. Uh, the Pitch Consortium is a nationwide consortium led by Susie here in Oxford together with Paul Klenemann at the Peter Medova building. And it consists of uh, several sites across the UK, Newcastle, Liverpool, Sheffield, Birmingham, and Oxford, also with involvement of UKHSA. And basically the aim is to really understand uh, T cell or in immune responses in healthcare workers uh, to COVID-19. Um, and it commenced at the start of the pandemic in April 2020, and since then we've recruited over 2,000 healthcare workers into this study. And just so you understand a bit better what the workflow of this is and how this looks, uh, not just here in Oxford, and, but also in other sites, basically what we do is we invite uh, healthcare workers um, to attend our clinics uh, whenever they have a breakthrough infection, but also post-vaccine or pre-vaccine. And we're collecting longitudinal samples from these people to, in order to understand, better understand the immune response, the waning and the boosting of immune responses. So people are invited to the clinic, they attend either the JR hospital clinic or, or clinic or the Churchill hospital clinic. And then our nurses collect uh, blood from them and they also uh, collect a thumb strip, which is basically just inserted into a nostril and collects the fluid inside your nostril so we can actually get uh, some data on mucosal antibodies as well. And these people are also provided with PCR or nasal swab kits, uh, which they can send in uh, for PCR testing if they think they have breakthrough infection. And then once the blood is collected, it comes down to the lab and our uh, research assistant Jody will process the blood. And the components we're really interested in are um, plasma on top, uh, which contains antibodies and other proteins of interest. And then this little fraction here uh, at the interface, interface, which contains all the important immune cells that we are interested in. And those are stored at ultra low temperatures for future analysis, functional analysis. So where are we up to with pitch at the moment? So we're tracking immune responses since 2020 and uh, where this little star, the red star is, this is the time point we're currently looking at. So we're just about to collect the pre v 5 uh, samples from people who will go on to receive the fifth dose. And this will be offered this week, I think we're beginning of next week to healthcare workers. And we're also collecting samples whenever people get breakthrough infection. And so since the start of the pandemic, and that's the um, figure on the bottom left, 
Uh, we've been tracking T cell responses to SARS-CoV-2, and we can see that these are very well maintained. So the first uh, gray dots, these are the baseline samples, and then you can see this nice increase after the first dose and a, a little bit more increase after the second dose. And then it, it, it's quite well maintained. It goes up um, slightly up and down a little bit, but um, really not, not much. And then also those responses are maintained um, in response to variants of concern like Omicron, BA1 and BA2, <clears throat> which is also important for us to understand in terms of protection uh, whenever new variants are coming up. Okay, so I'll hand over to Yanni. So hi everyone, uh, my name is Yanni. I'm a second year DFS student in this group. So uh, I'm going to present some results from my uh, project. So despite uh, the widespread of SARS-CoV-2 infection, there are some people who reported that they never got uh, infections. So I'm looking at their antibody and T cell responses. And to do this, I, um, I collected, our group collected uh, samples from participants. Uh, the unexposed is people who are recruited early pandemic and like detected infections are people who got their uh, breakthrough infections within the last 30 days. And the no known infection, these are people who self-reported as never had infection since the beginning of pandemic. So to do this, I'm going to measure the, well, I measure the immune responses to a uh, spike protein, which is the component uh, that present in the vaccine that's been deployed in the UK and also uh, measure the immune responses to other uh, non-spike proteins, including membrane nucleocapsid, uh, non-structural protein, and open reading frames. So for antibody, I use uh, MSD platform, uh, and for to measure the T cells, I use Alispot and also the proliferation assay. So um, as we can see in this figure, People who have been vaccinated, this is uh, DI is people who just, uh, they got that breakthrough, in vaccinated and got a uh, breakthrough infection after vaccination. And NKI is people who have been vaccinated and reported as never been um, infected. So as expected, uh, people who have been vaccinated have responses to spike protein. Um, and, and here is nuclear capsids. So people who have breakthrough infection, they have responses to non-spike proteins, which not present in the vaccine that they receive. Um, while people who reported as never got infections, about 30% of those uh, actually got response antibody to nucleocapsids. So how about their T cell responses? Uh, for uh, T cell responses, as we can see here, uh, Unexposed people who are recruited uh, early on pandemic, they don't have uh, responses to spike because they're not vaccinated. And as expected, people are vaccinate, uh, vaccinated, they actually have uh, T cell responses to spike. And about the other responses um, to non-spike proteins, um, similarly to antibody people who are reported, um, there are some people who actually have responses to non-spike proteins and the DI are people um, who actually got breakthrough infection. So they have responses to other non-spike proteins. Um, so in this graph here, I just want to show like uh, the proportion of responders. Um, bear with me with this. Uh, so the black one is people who are, uh, the unexposed people as expected, um, most of the time they not responded uh, to spike are a uh, non-spike, while people who got their rate uh, infection, they're actually um, higher proportions in people who have a uh, spike and non-spike. And next is people who are reported as never got infections. Um, you can see like some of them actually have um, responses to non-spike, which indicate that they may actually have like asymptomatic infections. Uh, so for early spot, we can only measure like the interferon gamma secreting cells, and we cannot differentiate whether it is like, coming from CD4 or CD8. Uh, so using the proliferation assay, um, this is to differentiate whether the response is coming from CD4 or CD8. Um, and again, as we can see, people are unexposed; they don't really uh, respond that much. Um, and the result here, we kind of see that people um, who self-reported has never been infected seem to have like more responses, but uh, also noted like the number of um, people, the samples that I have is actually much higher than uh, 
breakthrough infection. So this is still working in progress and I still need to add more data um, just to confirm this finding. So yeah, uh, that is the result that I got so far. Um, people who have been vaccinated, they have antibody and T cell responses to spike proteins. And uh, people who got breakthrough infections, they do have responses to non-spike proteins, um, which is very different from people who are unexposed. Um, they don't have responses to non-spike. Um, so yeah, uh, before I go, I also want to say just thank you to participants who actually volunteer for my study. Um, I know some of you are actually here in this uh, room, so thank you so much, or even like people who actually um, express their interest to volunteer. So yeah, thank you. Hi, um, so my name is Marta. I'm a postdoc in Suzy's lab, and I will be going through very briefly two projects that I've been involved in. Uh, the first one that has been mentioned a few times is the Seco Variants Project, which is a South East Asia initiative to combat SARS-CoV-2 variants. Uh, it's uh, a collaborative study between three countries in Southeast Asia, Vietnam, Indonesia, and Thailand, and uh, <clears throat> experts at the University of Oxford, which are listed here. And it's led by uh, Professor Tan in Vietnam. So as we know that uh, viruses do mutate and SARS-CoV-2 has shown uh, a number of mutations since the beginning, starting with the uh, Wuhan, um, going to, for example, Delta and then Omicron and Omicron leading to the rise of XBB 1.5 and XBB 1.16, which are shown here. And since then, there have been also other developments and variants that have come about. And we're interested in these because mutations can often lead uh, affect viral fitness, uh, making the virus more transmissible, uh, causing more severe disease or uh, giving it the ability to evade our immunity. Uh, however, this isn't the case with all variants, and we know that some of them have faded away. But in an ideal situation, we want to know as soon as a new variant arises, how fit is it and will it affect or will it have a significant impact in the public? So the aim of the study is to develop and apply a multidisciplinary research platform in Southeast Asia for rapid assessment of the biological significance of SARS-CoV-2 variants, thereby informing a coordinated local and regional as well as a global response to COVID-19 pandemic, and to use this platform for future outbreaks and to use it for other pathogens as well. Uh, this is quite a busy slide, so I will just mention it briefly to show you the study design, which involves the use of already stored serum and cells, which have been stored uh, pre-pandemic, as well as the initial phase of the pandemic, and which currently is also ongoing with uh, the newer variants. Uh, the use of uh, the genome of the virus that have been sequenced, uh, still again, we continue to sequence the new variants and uh, use those in that information. And from that, we will develop uh, or design peptide libraries, uh, which we could use for laboratory tests to look at T-cell responses, look at neutralizing antibodies from the plasma. And based on the laboratory findings and together with the clinical uh, situation of these viruses, we hope to define uh, the variants which have biological significance, and then this will be communicated to experts in health policy to have the appropriate impact. Uh, so the, the project has uh, a significant component of capacity building, which has been taking place. So you have already seen the slide where Priyanka is giving training in Vietnam. We have had a, a student, a PhD student who visited us from Thailand, who spent about six months in our lab uh, working on T-cell responses. And we now have also two PhD students with whom we have met already today uh, doing their PhDs in Oxford from Indonesia. Uh, and the project continues currently. So that's that's it for this one. And then the second project that I will briefly mention is uh, on antimicrobial resistance. Uh, it focuses on identification of new vaccine candidates for uh, two of the pathogens that cause AMR. It is uh, at the stage of uh, the pump priming stage supported by uh, these agencies. And uh, the PI in this project is Vicky, who has, uh, in addition to the, the first two fundings, she has recently received uh, funding from Back to Back to continue this project. 
the aim of this project is to identify new vaccine and therapeutic candidates for E. coli and uh, K pneumonia, which are two amongst the highest prevalent uh, bacteria causing AMR. Uh, these are two of them. Uh, by screening patient cohorts for antibody and T cell responses to key virulent factors. So the participants will include cohorts from UK as well as Vietnam. And these are uh, patients who have bloodstream infection caused by E. coli and K pneumonia, as well as healthy controls from both, uh, both countries. And the design for this project uh, involves selecting uh, target proteins uh, through the literature search and available database, uh, which Vicky has already done. Uh, and then manufacturing the proteins, which for some, to some extent has already been done. And then after that, we will screen for immunogenicity in our lab uh, by looking at interferon gamma, early spot T cell responses and ELISA uh, to look for antibody responses. And finally, the analysis will include comparing the immune responses between bacteremic patients and healthy controls in the two countries, as well as the difference between the UK and Vietnam and explore if the disease severity uh, survival are associated with the immune responses they have for these selected proteins. Um, I'm just gonna give you a really brief update on two projects that I think Barbara talked about um, last year. So um, I'm Susie's project manager for her meliodosis work. And this is MELVAC1, which is gonna be our phase one clinical trial and the first ever clinical trial of a meliodosis vaccine. Um, it's definitely been a bumpy road getting to the point of starting and we're really hoping to kick off next year. And I think um, COVID of course has been a challenge and a lot of resources were um, directed to that, not internally in the group, but um, globally in terms of components for vaccines. Um, but also um, another challenge is it's, there's, there's quite a lot of components going together to be mixed um, and delivered to the participants. So um, the, the vials in the top corner there, um, there's going to be a capsular polysaccharide protein conjugate and then an, another antigen from the Burkholderia bacterium, um, a protein HTP1, and then also mixed together with two adjuvants. So um, getting all those different parts together um, is taking its time, but we're making good progress. And then I'll whiz straight on to the second project, which is something we've been working on a lot in the meantime, um, uh, with partners in Moru that are carrying out a lot of the work and been really busy with this, um, surveying attitudes. Um, well, <laughs> several parts to it are coming up on the next slide, um, talking to people about their awareness of melioidosis as a problem, um, their attitudes towards vaccinations in general, and also um, taking part in the in vaccine trials because um, in Ubon Ratchatani, um, the site where we're carrying out this, this project, um, it's not an area where vaccine trials um, are typically carried out. Perhaps um, most people won't be um, exposed to that at all. And like in Oxford, where I know a lot of you will be bombarded with adverts to take part in clinical trials all the time. So um, uh, yeah, asking people about their perceptions and willingness to take part in a future trial, because obviously after the phase one of the meliodosis vaccine in Oxford, um, the next stage is to go um, to endemic areas. Um, so we'll just whiz through, um, we've got some, uh, quite a lot of interviews have taken place, There's still um, some more to go, but we've got some early themes that have um, started to arise about how different age groups um, uh, receive their information about um, disease outbreaks and vaccination, um, some more outward looking and um, some more passively received information. And um, we've had some really positive responses about um, a mixture of responses, but um, um, some really positive responses about taking part in trials and um, quite nice to see some, uh, yeah, a good mixture of responses to that. 